Welcome to Life on Life's Terms, episode 46. It's Justin and... And it's Kenny. We're, uh, we're going to get into the, the continuing theme of Sober October, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, humility and humbleness and how to maintain that within your life and uh, what, those, what those qualities can do for you. Uh, so how's your week going so far? Uh, it's going all right, um, considering I, I got that funeral coming up on Friday for, oh, my, yeah. for my friend that passed. But uh, How are you dealing with that? You know, like it's okay, but when I start thinking about him or something or seeing pictures, and uh, uh, then I start feeling some pain. Uh, a couple, couple nights I had a hard time like falling asleep and staying asleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just called somebody in the middle of the night. I, I have a good friend of mine who mm-hmm. actually just lost his two brothers and and his dad all within like three months oh yeah so uh he he knows loss he knows grieving and uh he's been a big sport for me right now i think yeah i and and as unfortunate as it is i think all of us within the in this world um we see it a lot we see it a lot more than i think than other people we see it we see a lot of death yeah you know yeah. Um, I think one of, I've said this before on the show and I'll say it again. One of, one of the first things that my sponsor told me is, uh, if you're going to stick around in recovery, get yourself a good suit because you're going to go to a lot of funerals. Yeah. Um, I don't go to funerals anymore. I, I did. I, I swore them off a long time ago too, but when it hits this close to home. Then... See, that's different though, right? When it's, when it's that, that's different. But like sponsees and stuff, I just, I just don't go anymore. Yeah. And it's not that it's not that I'm trying to show support or anything. It's just there's a lot. Like there's a lot there's a lot of funerals that that one can go to, right? I've had I've had my share of funeral food. So I'm I just don't go. I mean, I think I think my prayers mean more than my actual appearance uh, for some, I think, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, I hear you. Um so other than that, how's life? Life's going really good. Uh, yeah, I had my girls on the weekend. Oh yeah, how yeah. was that? Oh, we had lots of fun. We did. Uh, I built dream boards with them. I got them to build their own dream boards, and I I've been saving up magazines for this art procedure. Cool. And uh, I took them to my friend's house, who has like literally like five thousand dollars worth of stamp it products, mm-hmm. and uh, they stamped their names on it, and they put cut out cool shapes of designed paper and put on all the pictures of the stuff that they like. And it was, it was good. It was really fun. That's cool. Yeah. That's, that sounds, that's, that's, that sounds like a good time. <laughs> it was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a little, a little bit tired today. It's been, it's been, uh, you're stoned, but not stoned. No, I'm not stoned. <laughs> um, it's been, it's, it's just been a trying week so far. Um, this is the uh, week that marijuana is legalized in Canada. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I really, yeah. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter much in my life. Uh, I mean, it doesn't dictate that I'm going to be getting high. Uh, maybe other people, sure. I guess uh, all of the marijuana is sold out, all legal marijuana is sold out in Canada as of like a couple hours ago. So they're ha- they're actually going to be closed for the next three days in order to restock. <laughs> we need a re up. Yeah, yeah, basically, right? <laughs> um, Got to see the plug. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been obviously my ears really close to addictions, and I've been hearing certain things. You know what I want to get into is uh, so we had Chris Suchit in. I think uh, my suggestion to you, Kenny, is you got to listen to that show. Okay. And the reason why I'm suggesting this to you is I'm not trying to plug a show. I'm just saying that. Chris has 44 years worth of time in the addiction field as a practicing counselor. Yeah. And typically the um, burnout rate is six years. And he's been able to maintain this for 44 years. We got, I literally asked him the question, like, how as a counselor do you deal with suicide when one of your clients have committed suicide? His response is mind bending. What did he say? Well, you, you got to listen ah. because some of the stuff that he had said, I I would be doing it in an injustice to reiterate it. Yeah, like I just, it just, it just went. I went, I went farewell doing it. But to hear this is the beauty about Chris, in my opinion, 
and I stated this also in the blog, he has usable skills. You know what I mean? Like usable things, right? That that he's been using over 44 years in order to maintain mental health in this field without allowing without allowing death to take him down or allowing tragedy. And like, I mean, we hear all sorts of things in the addiction field of people's story, even some of the stuff that we've lived through and not to take that home sometimes is a difficult task to do, but he gave serious, serious insight on what not to do, you know, cut blank, black and white, do not do this. Right. So, it was, it was a how-to guide in order to survive in the addiction field, you know what I mean? Or in the, the caring health field, as well as parents dealing with, like, we went into when is it time to do tough love, flat out. And he's the one who gave the diagnosis of what those boundaries look like and what you need to ask yourself as a parent if, if that's where you're going to go. If you're going to go to tough love, this is what the situation might be have to look like in order for that to happen and so and he he broke down I mean it was amazing the information that he gave us yesterday like anybody who needs a how-to guide on how to deal with things in a healthy way and to be subjective um he he did that for us 100 percent I think this is kind of the segue into the humility and humbleness um so let's talk about do you have internet close to you I have probably internet closer closer to me. I got so, some. You got a phone? Yeah. Let's look up uh, the definition of humility. So one of the things um, that I that I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding with humility is like I have egg on my face, <laughs> so I'm humiliated. A modest or low view of one owns of one's own importance. Humbleness. Mm-hmm. A modest or low view of one's own importance so now uh ask your google to give you an example of humility and it will typically do that um sometimes it's nice to have an example because when you have an example uh, it allows you to kind of really see what that that definition is saying i mean i think I think this is one of the things, especially for addicts and even parents that we're faced with is when you become humbled, <laughs> when you realize there's not a damn thing that you're doing for your loved one who's an addict. Examples of humility. Mm-hmm. Humility is the quality of being humble and means putting the needs of another person before your own and thinking of others before yourself. It also means not drawing attention to yourself and it can mean acknowledging that you are not always right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you how do you practice humility? I always admit when I fuck up. Yeah, so that's if we're going to re uh reference the steps, that's that good old step 10. I always admit it. I'll be like, "Okay, yeah, I screwed up." First thing. If I realize it was wrong, then I I say it, I state it, and then I go about trying to make it right. It it's difficult though in the moment to do it, right? I've been doing it since I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I learned. I think one of the, I think one of the other things that, that I had learned with humbling myself is looking at what's going on in my life and then taking inventory if it's too much and being able to recognize and say, you know what, I'm not giving a hundred percent in everything. So I'm walking it back a little bit. And when I do that, that's humbling for me because I'm the guy who wants to think that they can do everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And being able to walk myself back from that is really difficult when I have to go to somebody and be like, uh, I bit off more than I can chew, you know, yeah. because, yeah. because in that moment I feel, it feels like that I'm going to be attacking my integrity and my credibility. Right. Yeah. yeah I hear you. Yeah. But it, really what it is, is I just oversighted. Right. Um, do you ever put yourself in situations in order to be humbled? Um, go into that a little bit more for me. I'm so like in your addiction, when you woke up filled with shit, piss and puke all over you, that was a situation that you put yourself in to be, to be pretty fucking humbled, you know, like, yeah. like you don't chug three big bears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I think Americans would get Colt 45. Cold for, yeah. Don't yeah, yeah. chug three of those. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So that would be an idea, but in a healthy way today. Like, do you put yourself in humbling situations? So like, for instance, I was going to get into this a little bit later, but right after this show, I'm going to a Shambhala meditation center. Yeah. Shambhala. Shambhala. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, like I said, I'm a little tired. Uh, so anyways, uh, going, going there is a little bit out of my comfort zone. I've been to temples before, yeah. but I'm not really sure what to expect. And I actually had to register. So these people know that I'm coming. Cool. They're anticipating me. It's, you know what I mean? So I'm kind of like, Oh shit. Like, do I really want to do this kind of thing? You know? Yeah. Um, I find so- that like being around my kids is really humbling for me. Like super humbling. I think, I think, I think one of the things is that I'm getting at is to be, to recognize that you're on, you're going to be uncomfortable and still go in there because that's. Yeah. Well this weekend I'm, I'm going to be kind of uncomfortable in that star of the North retreat. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was going to be going Friday, Saturday and leaving sun or staying half Sunday, Mm -hmm. but because that funeral, I can't go Friday. I have to go, but I'm going Saturday morning and then leaving Sunday afternoon. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be awkward for me, especially with all like the churchy stuff around. Yeah. And uh like the chapel that's in like, there. Like I'm still going to go to them and like do do the prayer meditations and stuff like that and like I'm just going to accept it for what it is and like try to, you know, like through their guided meditations or whatever, like find my source. Yeah. And like I think what you'll find, so just to give you a bit of insight cuz been there, like I've been there. Um they're not going to go all Jesus Christ on you. No? No. Okay. Well, I've I've done the Jesus trip before, so I'm okay with it. No. They they won't they won't go they won't go all Jesus Christ holy roller on you. Like they're pretty they're pretty down down the middle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like sure there's a chapel in there. Yeah, well, I've seen some uh indigenous culture stuff. Yeah. So, there's so that's yeah. cool. Yeah, there's definitely and they'll I think they're on a tr- they're on treaty land. As well. We're they'll, all on treaty land, they'll, buddy. They'll, they'll tell you exactly what's treaty up six. there. Yeah, they'll they'll tell you. No, no, there's more to it than just that, though, where they are. Because it was Oblate. It was Oblate owned. Oblate says, like, uh, a priest, a Catholic priestly order. Okay. So, like, U- Eugene de Mazenod was the founder. And there's a whole lineage. They, she might go into it. She might not. I don't know. Um, but there's there's a whole bunch of stuff behind that. Cool. Um, yeah, but in that moment being uncomfortable, I think you have to recognize that you don't know shit in the moment. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know a damn thing. You know what I mean? It's the same, same thing when you first walked into your first meeting. Yeah. That's like the scariest thing. It was really scary. I went with my mom. (laughs) Did you? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you share? Were you asked to share your first time? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. And was it like my life sucks or was it like, no, I just, uh, showed appreciation for the other people's openness. Mm. Um, I just said, I was there for a reason. So yeah, uh, I'll see you next week. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah. Uh, my first meeting I cried. Yeah. I think I cried too. I was pretty, I was pretty upset. And my first meeting was when I was in treatment. Actually, that's not true. So I did go to an AA meeting once with an ex-girlfriend, but she, she's the one who needed it. And I didn't, I was just like accompanying her. Right. Uh, pretty sure I showed up drunk to the meeting. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. But you know, I didn't, I didn't have a problem cause I was still making money. Um, but she's the one who was really messed up. I wasn't lo and behold there. I was, I think like four or five years later in my own meeting, crying my eyes out with all the wreckage that I had. Yeah, exactly. Especially like, and I was in a pretty intense short term, intense treatment center. Yeah. So like there, there was like, let's get all this stuff out and then we're going to leave you. (laughs) Right. And then you're going to a meeting like with all that emotional baggage, you know, which was, that was pretty difficult. Um, What was it like? When you recognized for your set of steps that you didn't know what they were really talking about and you needed a guide, what was that like, that kind of acceptance? I didn't get started with my steps till I was in jail, like, years after that. Okay. And, uh, yeah, like, we did it with a, a group of people to make it easier. 
I think, you know what? I was actually the sponsor outside telling that particular person how to read the book. Yeah. Yeah. We were in the Fort, uh, Fort Saskatchewan Provincial Jail. No, it was an ERC, Edmonton Remand Center. I was guiding somebody through a set of steps in boot camp, though. Oh, yeah. It was in boot camp. No, it was way before boot camp. And I was gu- I was guiding them through those. Uh, I mean, I think I think back to that humility and humbleness. There's a piece that where there's acceptance. You need to accept in the moment that you're not like it's not it's not about you in the moment. You know what I mean? Um, if there's any cure that I know for depression. It's grab a book, go to an old age home and read. Yeah. That will save the day a hundred, a hundred times out of a hundred. If you're feeling depressed, it's the most difficult thing to do in the world is to grab a book and go and be in front of people. But, uh, there's a saying called fake it till you make it or faith it until you make it. I like that one. I never heard that one before. You know, or perseverance will make it for you, right? Yeah. Uh, you kind of almost just have to put on a mask and get there, but that will 100% or go feed the homeless or whatever whatever you got to do in order to be of service, that will 100%. You know, it's funny. I was, in, I was in a discussion with some people yesterday, and they were talking about eventually, so this this thing that we were reading was written way long time ago, and it was like eventually our society is going to be a play in it's going to be at a place where great abundance is going to be around us and we're going to want for nothing. So that's what we know. Pretty much is what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yet if we look at today, everybody's depressed. Yeah. The majority of people have low self-esteem. Yeah. Majority of people have no self-purpose. Why do you think that is? Well, I think a lot of it is because we lost, uh, we lost the sight of what service work can do. I think we lost that. Right. Because we really want for nothing. However, when it comes to trying, you actually have to go out of your way to help somebody. You know, true story. I had a guy that I was working with in recovery a long, long time ago in my early days. And uh, the guy had a real hard time with like liking helping people. Just couldn't get past that. Like, why the fuck would I want to help people? It was always his saying, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. So I sent him to a Safeway and I said, you're going to open the door for everybody that walks into that Safeway for like the next four hours. I'm going to sit in the parking lot. I want to watch you in my car to make sure that you don't leave. Okay. He was fucking kicked off the property. <laughs> what? <laughs> He was asked to leave. So Safeway, I think everybody knows what a Safeway is. It's a grocery store. Um, But he was asked to leave because they said that he was harassing the customers because he kept on opening the door, whether they wanted to go in or not. And actually that Safeway, what they did was they put the sliding doors in (laughs) because he kept opening them, right? Like like it was a couple weeks later or whatever. (laughs) But so he wasn't allowed to go. And this is the same guy who went and did a confession to a homeless guy on the bench. Yeah. So he's sitting on this bench doing his confession with this homeless guy. Again, the guy had an accountability issue. So I was sitting across the street watching him because he wouldn't do the confession with me. And this homeless guy was literally getting up to walk away and he'd grab him by the arm, pull him back to the bench and said, I'm not done yet. (laughs) (laughs) And he kept telling him all of his shit, you know? And then the guy would get up, the homeless guy would try to get up and go again. He'd say, no, no, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. And then he would pull him back to the bench to keep it going, right? Like, I mean, again, I think humility comes down to willingness. Yeah. Are you willing to accept what's about to happen? And if and if you're not willing, I don't think humility can really come. You know what I mean? It can't it can't be there. We had you and I had a discussion that I think people who live in the mountains are more humble than those who live in the city. Yeah. Because they're always around grandiose sites. Yeah, for sure. Right? When you're staring at a mountain every day. Yeah. Right? So yeah. you always feel small. Do you, what do you think depression comes from in our society today, aside from social media? Well, like, I think it's just like the innate uh, desire to compete with the next person. You're always in like a state of competition. And I think from what I've read <clears throat> and from my own experience, if you're, if you're worried about chasing the goal because you want to catch up to the next guy, then you're, you're not chasing the goal for the right reason. Yeah. Yeah. Gra- 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. I also feel that there's a lot of pressure in society because we are starting to compare with countries that we've never really had to, to compete with. And now that we're not just daring to compare, we're also having to compete with them. Um, inadequacies are starting to show. Yeah. You know, and I think that that scares a lot of people and they don't feel like they're measuring up. Um, have you ever given thought to why it is that people, some people are more successful in their suicide than they are in their, in seeking help for their suicide? Well, you know, I met somebody the other day and, uh, well, I was talking to somebody the other day and I've known them for a while and they tried to commit suicide like 50 times. Mm -hmm. And they never succeeded. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's God or odd, like you say, but yeah. or his, he's got a purpose. He's mm -hmm. got some purpose that he hasn't yet fulfilled that is keeping him from leaving. Um, and I think, like, to reach out for it, like, that comes down to humility. You know, it's like, how do I, how do I go up to this person and, and show them that I'm struggling because mm -hmm. like everybody's in this state of competition. Everybody wants to be better than the next guy and everybody wants to look strong and and nobody wants to look weak. And I think it's part of being humble to, you know, s say to yourself, okay, yeah, I need help. Yeah. And uh, I think a, a lot of people have a hard time with that. Well, and I think that there's a lot of, see in my opinion, when somebody is exuberating humility, or, or practicing it in that moment. Um, I think that that's actually uh, quite strong for somebody to be able to be that vulnerable, right? Yeah, like you and I can see that. Like vulnerability is, it does require actually, a lot of strength. When I was in the life, there was a guy um, I was collecting from. And when that ended up happening, um, so it was like, it was a small debt and it was a TV that yeah. I was taking from this guy. And I remember him literally on the phone with his girlfriend saying, I'm a fucking junkie and I can't do this anymore. And this guy's going to take either the fucking TV or he's going to take something else that you're really going to want. So either way, we're giving him something. And it's not going to be my dick. Yeah. And, and like, I don't want to be... I, I, and when he was sitting there saying, I can't handle this anymore, that was the first time ever where that my old facade cracked. And I was like, maybe I'm going to let this guy off the hook. Did you? No. I took the TV. Yeah, I've done some like pretty bad shit that I'm ashamed of. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I guess I, I didn't have to take the TV, but I mean... It's it's not so much that you want to, it's the people that are around you. That you have to uphold your image to. That's right. The principle. It's yeah. the principle. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think... Retarded. That was the first time I ever witnessed humility, though, without thinking the guy was soft. Right? Like, I, at that time, had actually thought to myself, I wish I could admit that I was an addict. You know what I mean? Or I wish that I could admit that this life isn't what it's all cracked up to be. You know what I mean? I put a big blog on social media the other day about how stupid the mindset is of the criminal. Yeah? Yeah. And even though I have a whole bunch of like old friends still on my Facebook that are still out there hustling, I didn't give a shit. I said it's pathetic because, you know, it's part of that mindset that kept me from my friend who killed himself. And it's part of that mindset that probably drove him to kill himself. I mean, you never really know, right? At the end of the day, I don't think I don't I don't think anybody ever really knows. But I think one of the things is is um, again, I had to do this um, when I came to the precipice, whether I was going to continue any relationship with any family member that was still in that lifestyle, because it wasn't. I didn't have to worry about any of the people that were around me because they weren't going to talk to me anyways. Yeah. Right. Um, but family members, was I going to even engage them in a in a civil way? And did I even want to be around that? Yeah. And that was difficult for me to stand at that line and say, that was humbling for me to be like, nope, I'm 
I'm done. Like I'm really done. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to be around them. My life is better without them. And that was even after the amends. Yeah. Right. Like, like my amends. I hear, I hear you, bro. I've done the same thing right now. Like that, and it's, and it, if you feel like a lonesome soldier again, like you're that lone wolf, because, because there's an ideology like you're gonna go to war with those people. Those people have your back in war, right? But the reality is the people outside of that thing have your back more so than the people who are still running in that world. Mm-hmm. If there's anything that I've always come to understand is always true with anybody of our mindset, you're either in or out. Yeah, There's no such fucking thing as half in, half out. No. And I think to be able to recognize that, again, is, is a value of humility. To recognize that I'm an all in, all out guy. There's no halfway for me. You know, if I'm taking your TV as much as I may think that, that you, I don't need to take it from you, I still have to take it from you. You know what I mean? Because you're all in. As shitty as that is. Yeah. Right. And today, the only thing that that quality has helped me, helped me with in a positive way as I I'm either all in something bad or I'm all out of something bad. And I haven't been all in something bad in a really long time. Right. So that's where that mentality has actually been positive for me today. Like, like, am I all in recovery or am I all out? Because I know if I do one thing that's out of sobriety, I'm, I'm going to all the other shit soon enough. Like I don't have, I don't have a line of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And again, that, that's another piece of humility, right? I heard this too in that discussion last night where somebody said to me, they said, I feel bad for those who need to escape reality because they're the ones who are really weak, you know? And when I heard that, I was like, that's pretty shitty to say about people, but I get it. I get it. When you need a reprieve, reprieve basically the, what that word is meaning is that you're pushing off shittiness, Mm -hmm. right or you're looking for a moment of escape Mm -hmm. right i can find that without going to a drink without smoking a joint without doing math without doing cocaine whatever it may be i don't need any of that in order to find my reprieve so then you know what i recognized after that is that the true state of nirvana because i can detach myself so much from life that i don't allow it to affect me and have suffering within my life yeah yeah, absolutely it is. Right? So how do we get to that place? How do we live that way? And after practicing what I would suggest is situations that are humbling time and time and time and time again, you become detached from all that. And going through as much death that we go through in recovery, you get detached from that suffering too, mm-hmm. as unfortunate as it is. Right? But you don't loathe it anymore you're okay because you have an understanding and a concept of your higher power finally and something of the afterlife right that's why you're able to detach right and i think that's all encompassing but first you have to recognize that a reprieve and a man-made thing is never going to give you detachment it's never going to give you a sense of bliss or a sense of just gratitude and being okay. It's never going to give you a, 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 a sense of ease to your mind. Because as soon as that buzz is gone, whether you're a normal drinker or an alcoholic, in my opinion, that situation is still going to be there. Right? Like you always hear about a relapse and they say, oh, I, I got robbed, so I smoked a joint. Well, now you got robbed and now you have your drug addiction back in back on your back yeah right like like now it's not like one was to help one problem like you always hear people like i heard this a little while ago i got robbed so i smoked a joint well did that help anything (laughs) no took his mind off of it but either way what's what's that going to do he still has the problem and it hasn't been solved and there's no solution yeah right it's 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 a weight right there's one thing that I've recognized. I can't wait anymore. I'm already an impatient guy. I remember waiting for my drugs. <laughs> I was not a nice guy waiting for my drugs. And I wait, waited for like 
I wasn't waiting for an ounce. I was waiting for like keys. And I was, <laughs> I was like twitching for my shit. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I didn't want like even that. And I was, I remember thinking like, cause I was running phones by then. And I was a kid who learned the trade run, like being on a phone and then became the boss and then so and so up up the chain basically right Mm -hmm. and i remember being on the phone being the runner on the phone going to houses going to places or whatever and like seeing people twitch and taking a shit because you know they just ordered up some crack or whatever because that's what people do for the most part some people do right shitter bitch i had this girl on my phone way back in time shitter bitch named shitter bitch and she shit herself in the back of my truck so she used to come up and grab with one of her hands in her asshole and the other hand to grab it. And then all of a sudden I saw her getting like all excited about a conversation and both hands were moving. And I was like, what the fuck? And she shit herself in the back of my truck all over the back seat. So ever since then, cause I always drove shitty vehicles like, you know, beaters or whatever. Yeah. Ever since then I would take like garbage bags and just staple it to the fucking upholstery <laughs> in, in the back seat of that vehicle. Right. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, shitter bitch. We used to have a runner car. They just it was a Ford Tempo, and it just didn't have any back seats. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I say, like, yeah, get in, and they're just sitting on the. They're just, the just kneeling. They're just sitting on the metal, the bobbing, frame. fucking. Yeah. Their heads are like hitting the top. <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, and again, that's back to humility to see her do that. Right? Like, that's pretty fucking humbling to know that you're going to shit your pants every time you or- you're you ordering up your drug of choice. Yeah, but I'm going to still keep ordering it. Did you ever get any of that when you were... No. No? No. I didn't I didn't really... I get the twitch, but I never got, like, bowel issues. Bowel but, excitement? Yeah, but, like, well, it's because they cut the coke with x <laughs> So, like... That's... No, no, but these guys are... They're, they're shitting before they do it. Yeah, but that's because it's all mind. Uh, yeah. It's all mind, right? So, yeah. like, and I wasn't doing that bullshit. Like, I got good drugs. <laughs> I didn't get the stuff that was up on the street. Like, why would you do that? That's, that's like, and see, that mentality for a long time kept me sick. Where I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not an addict. I'm, a, I'm like, I sell this. Yeah. I'm like, a G. Yeah. Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a, drug addict like those people can't afford it i can yeah you know um even when you can afford it though it's not your best friend it's it's the white devil you know <laughs> like it's it's, it's the devil's dandruff exactly yeah yeah i mean I, yeah um back on track though do you have any expectations out of this weekend um yeah i'm gonna do some art while i'm there because i can mm-hmm. there's time put away for for art or reading or mm-hmm. reflecting. Yeah. So I figure I continue with my art challenge and uh, get a piece done. The food will be good. Yeah? Mm-hmm. It's excited. pretty good. Unless they change the cook, but it's probably good. Cool. Uh, any... You haven't seen the garden there either. No. Oh, you're going to be... Well, you know what? I, I, I know, like... Yeah, I have seen the garden. Okay. Because like, I've cut through there walking before. No, no, but there's a garden in the middle of the building. Oh, okay. Then that's secluded. Like, okay. there's the gazebo thing. Well, there's, like, a big garden out back. Yeah, that's not the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's actually going to be, uh, like, a maze. Okay. In time, once it's all grown in, because it's not high enough yet. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, yeah, there's a garden, like, right in the middle of that place. You can't go into it. You just look at it from the outside truly that place is like a microcosm yeah like its own little world yeah it really is and as soon as you walk in there you'll notice it like like in the right now cool you know how was the lieutenant's the governor lieutenant's thing i saw your instagram so it was the lieutenant governor's circle on mental health and addiction yeah uh they had some awards and uh, a fella that I work with at a nonprofit mm-hmm. received the award of true compassion. Okay. Um, yeah, it was really good. I I met some cool people. Yeah. And uh, potentially some pretty interesting guests. Yeah. On the show. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm gonna find out more about that. I'm gonna send out a few emails and uh, see what I can pull together. 
Excellent. Yeah. How was the food? They didn't have any food. I was pretty choked. I didn't even eat dinner because I went there. I'm like, they have to have dinner. Like, it has to be dinner. They had <laughs> shitty desserts afterwards. Like, not like even Costco? Or not even yeah, Costco? Yeah, like Costco. For sure it was Costco. Huh. Yeah. I was disappointed with the food. I bet. But, uh, so, like, I was there in, like, the main, like, hall. In yeah. The con- and no one was in there. So I took a picture on like the throne. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I sat on the like the fanciest chair that was designated for the for the royalty that's visiting. Yeah. And uh and I took a picture. It's a nice legislator. Yeah, like, no, for like sure. The building's so was, nice inside. Yeah, it's called the government house and that was like the original legislature before the legislature yeah. was built. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a nice place. I mean, and I think they live there, right? Like they live in those uh, quarters. I, I think, think I think there's house attendants, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. it's it's pretty it's it's nice. I mean, oh, it's balling, man. It's like yeah. the, it's a sick old mansion. Yeah. I wonder when it was built. It's probably built like pre nineteen hundred, eh? Uh, probably not, because Alberta really wasn't settled till nineteen oh five, and then okay. it wasn't surveyed till about nineteen fifteen. Okay, and then so probably somewhere in there, okay. really. Like the only reason why Edmonton is the capital of Alberta is because of uh, the, the the river, like North Saskatchewan. Yeah, because North Saskatchewan goes from Edmonton all the way to Thunder Bay. Yeah. Right? So you can basically the fur trade, that's what it ran the entire, like all the way through, right? From Edmonton to Thunder Bay. But yeah, it's it's interesting that you got to go there. I mean, it's a good experience. Yeah. So like as I'm sitting there, I had this uh, premonition of of me getting an award there next oh, yeah. year. Yeah. And uh, so I like I felt it. Like I didn't think it. I felt it. Yeah. And then... Uh, at the end, I had a couple people come up to me that were part of the organization that I work at, and they're like, "Next year, we're nominating you for this one." I was like, "Sick." That's cool. Yeah. So we'll see. That's excellent. Manifest it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a good goal to keep in mind. I put it on my dream board. Oh, I built a dream board last night. Oh yeah. Yeah, a new one. It's like mostly all words. There's not as much pictures. Yeah. But uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Is it kind? Would you be willing to take a picture on your Instagram? Oh yeah, definitely. Show? Yeah, I'll, I'll post it. That's cool. Yeah, I don't. I haven't really done things like that. I just have a list of goals, really, and I knock them off. Yeah, like that's 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 what seems to work for me. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest things that I always try to maintain is staying in service. Yeah, like as long as I'm working working to help others whether that be in business, addiction, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other thing is when you take that quality of humility and you just literally encompass it so that it's the grain work of everything that you do. Yeah. Right? And every time I think I know humility, I recognize that I find that I don't. Right? Like every time I think I got that thing cornered, that quality cornered, it's not... It's not even like that's not even what it is. And then all of a sudden it becomes obscure and abstract again to me. Mm-hmm. And then I have to work on it again. Right. Lots of people ask me like, I want uh, like that are still in recovery or like still in active addiction. They're like, I want to be where you're at. Like you're doing all these big things and like you're, you're involved in the community so much. I'm like, well, yeah, man, just like start volunteering. I was like, all, all I really did was change my intention yeah. All I really did was decide that being a gangster isn't cool anymore. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And then, like, since then, everything's been working out. Yeah, I mean, and I think for some of us, that choice isn't even given anymore. Like, that's not a viable option as a business plan. You know no. what I mean? No. Like, like I was, when I was in EYOC, I was talking to those kids. Yeah. <laughs> I was, like, uh, they're all talking about how they want to go to Con University, which they figure is... Uh, the pen. Uh, but a particular one, Mail Haven, the shoe. They want it. They all want to go to the special housing unit. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, one of the things that I had said was, "You guys are already on a list. Like you're fucked." I said, "I didn't get caught till I was 28 years old. They didn't even know who I was. I had a C pick. So a C pick is like, uh, if you're a known criminal or whatever, they're looking at you, but they need. They're looking for big time. Like they're not. They're not looking for." A possession charge. No, they want they want, they want something trafficking and guns. Yeah, like something big. Yeah, right. And um, so yeah. Anyways, uh, 
I was telling these kids, I was like, you guys are all, your, your criminal career is already done. The cops know who you are. You're done. As soon as they have a crime that fits your MO. Yeah. They're coming out for you. It's, it's a matter of time. Like change it now because you are destined to a life in, in jail. Like you're not destined for a life in crime and become like, you know, your American gangster, whatever you're not, or some guy from the Godfather. I don't even think those kids know what that movie is. Like, like, that's too old. but that's not who you're going to become. You're going to become schmucko in the fucking, in, in, in the jail looking to get fucking pen time. You know what I mean? Schmucko. Be- like, like that's, that's what you're going to be. Right. Like, yeah you're not you're not your reality is deluded about becoming like the guy who makes it in crime we know the people who've made it from drug dealing and transitioned into actual business yeah you would never catch that guy they were not not known motherfucker was a ghost yeah. through the entire thing you yeah. know what i mean like like th- that's the guy who makes it that's that's not these kids these no. these kids are they're done like their their criminal career is done. It's over before the end gets started. You know, and I yeah. I actually think that that's fortunate because I remember how much of a blow it was when I finally got pinched at 20, like 28, like yeah. a good pinch that was sticking and there was no bribe to be paid. Yeah. Cuz judges do take bribes. And uh I recognized right away how much shit regular people really get into. You know what I mean? Like, like I saw, like when you're, when you don't have that division anymore and you're just a regular schmucko dealing with serious charges, you're fucked. Oh yeah. Like you're <clears throat> fucked when you don't have, when you don't have the the money to pay, when you don't have the influence to make things happen anymore, you're done. Yeah. Like you're done. You're just an average. And like, I've seen the guys that went in and they still, they had like, quarter million dollars saved up from selling drugs and like that's that's a lot sure for guys selling drugs to save up and like you are pretty much successful at selling drugs but then if you get caught your quarter million dwindles quick yeah like they go and buy the most expensive lawyer who just soaks them dry for yeah 90 percent of it and then they still end up taking a pen bit yeah (laughs) right yeah. The more money you have, the more likely you're going to get, you're going to get serious time. Oh, yeah. Like, and, and I think again, that's the system trying to humble you. Yeah. Like, like that's the system trying to break you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like even now you look at the legalization of marijuana in Canada, let's face it. You think that was an easy business to get into? Not even in the slightest. I know guys who, who tried, there was 250 shops that tried to open up in Edmonton. Only 50 of them were granted. Wow. Because the other three, uh, 200 of them said, fuck it, after they gave their five grand to see all the hoops that they had to jump through. Mm-hmm. They're just like, I'm not doing this. They're like, it do- it's not worth my time to open up a shop. It's just not worth my time. Yeah. Right? And and I get a lot of that. They were trying to, I think what they were trying to do is they were trying to stop the criminal gangster or the organizations going legit. Yeah. You know? But guess who were the people who had the money to make it legit? Those people. Like, it's a front man just like the bar again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Same deal, right? Like, so it didn't It didn't really do anything in my opinion. But at the same time, I mean, that's the system trying to humble you. Well, all it did was make it so that they can have more taxes on the stuff and more laws to... to uh, get people for like impaired driving and stuff like that. Well, in the breakup, when you actually look at the breakup of, um, of taxation on marijuana, it's 30, 35%. Wow. That's how much the government's making off of it. Wow. That's more than liquor. Yep. Liquor's like what? 15%. I don't know. I think at the end of the day. Yeah. I think it's it's different for every province. Well, for Alberta, it is. Alberta is one of the cheapest for liquor. Yeah. But so let's explain a little bit. Basically, our provinces buy everything wholesale and then resell it to us. Essentially is how it works. Every province does that. Sweet. Like every province. So the province itself is the wholesaler. Yeah. Right. You can never be a wholesaler for booze. So if you own a liquor store, except for in Ontario, Ontario, that's actually a government job working at the beer store or working at the LCBO. Same thing in Quebec. That's a government job. Like they make good money. Like, you know, thirty five, forty thousand dollars a year. 
Well, that's not good money. For selling booze? Well, I suppose. Like, your buddy, uh, you bootlegging made more money than that, sure, but yeah. your buddy owning the fucking liquor store isn't making that kind of money. He's making that if he's the only one working the store. <laughs> yeah. Believe you, believe me, like, it's not it's not advantageous to get into the into the boo selling business, you unless, know, unless you're bootlegging. Yeah, like in Canada, all of that's controlled. Like it's it's all controlled. Same thing with marijuana now; it's all controlled. The stock market they actually reiterated the same thing with their numbers. All of the marijuana stocks in Canada flopped. Every single one of them, they flopped. We all lost anywhere from one point fourteen percent to all the way up to three point two percent in equity. So like literally the market was like, fuck you, Canada, you know, and I think a lot of people are underestimating it's going to be diff- more difficult now for Canadians to get visas into other countries with the weed law. Yeah. I mean, to think of it this way, when you go to the Netherlands or Holland to go smoke weed, you don't do that to enter Europe. You go to Holland after. Yeah. When you're going back to your home country, you know what I mean? That's when you go there. You don't go there as like one stop. Like Amsterdam, you go in and out or you make it that that's the last place you go to and then you come back to Canada hmm. or to America. And you're not – the other thing that you're going to st- start seeing stopping in Canada is what's called hopovers. So people who skip the pond, they come from like Britain to Canada, then Canada to China. China's not letting them in. That looks like it's trafficking. That's That's right away what it looks like. So now you're going to get all those hopovers – going to america instead of canada that's that's what you're gonna see Hmm. so in that respect it's gonna actually hurt my prediction it's gonna hurt the economy in that way and then you're gonna get all the weed trout tourists coming here right from the states from everywhere from from the states that didn't legalize well most most american states are legalized like the majority of them are oh right majority but that's what we're coming into final thoughts on humility um, you know, we're not human doings or human beings and to be, I think requires humility to be accepting of, of where you are at and what is in front of you for the day, not looking too far into the future or dwelling on the past requires humility. Being vulnerable requires humility, you know, for, for those that are still suffering in addiction it'll be the hardest but best decision you ever make to ask for help. Mm -hmm. You know, if those suffering from depression, it'll be the hardest, but the most beneficial, it'll be the most, you'll be able to gain the most off of asking somebody for help, even if it's just somebody to talk to. Yeah. And uh, I encourage anybody out there that's struggling to do so. I, and I, and I agree that like that, that telephone, I said it in the blog, the telephone feels like there's a one ton elephant sitting on it Yeah. when you have to make that phone call, right? Yeah. That's why I always used to, like, and I still say this to people, it would be a pleasure to work with you. You know, like, yeah. like you saved, you're saving my life right now. You know what I mean? By me being able to work with you in this. I mean, Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous told me a long time ago that the only reprieve to my next drink or the only... And and so you'll hear this people people say this in meetings all the time that there's no cure to your there's there's no there's no cure for it for alcoholism that's fine okay I can subscribe to that idea to a degree but they also say that there's no um, there's no uh, there's no stopping your next drink well that's bullshit because th- th- that book tells us right away in the beginning of chapter eleven. That the only way to stop your next drink is to go work intensively with another alcoholic. Literally, it says that. And it also reiterates that at the beginning of the book, before you're even in the book, it says that's the only way to stop your your addiction is by working with other people. The best thing I ever did was start volunteering and, and giving back. Mm-hmm. Even like while I was working full time, I would still volunteer like in the evenings and then I would have one day a week off and I would, I would spend that day doing work for an organization. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It is fulfilling, right? So there's the hour. Uh, wrap it up. All right, everybody. If you guys need a lawyer, Google Liam Connolly for all your will, media, and estate issues. Check this guy out. He is the counsel for you.
Yeah. We use him and yeah. he's great. Yeah, he's he stops some stuff for us. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, where can they catch our blogs? www.lifeonlifestermspodcast.com. Yeah. How are you liking doing the bo- pod, uh, the blog thing? The blogs are good as long as I get them done right after the show. <laughs> I hear ya. <laughs> because I hear if you. I wait like if too long, then I'm like trying to remember what the show is about and yeah, yeah. I take yeah. cliff notes sometimes. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. The, when the show's happening, right? Yeah. But yeah, if you want to see our afterthoughts about the show, definitely hit that website and go look at those blogs because they. They do definitely go with the show itself. I think that's... Yeah, I think everybody should check out the website anyways. Yeah. Check it out. Shoot us a message on there. Yeah. You can contact us directly. Sure can at the Let's Chat app. You'll get one of us for sure. All right. You guys have yourself a wonderful Friday. We'll talk to you next week. Next week. Bye for now. Toodles. <laughs>